We will start this session with a lecture in English. The one health approach considers the interdependence between human, animal, and environmental health, as a way to reduce the risk of future pandemics. According to our first speaker, one health is not only a concept, but a way of living. Madam President, over to you to introduce this foreign member of the Academy. Despite being unable to be with us in person uh, for the third Nectar letter, Ascendi agreed to virtually be with us today. Professor Thomas Bettenleiter has a PhD in Biology of the University of Tübingen. After, uh, um, in, in, sorry, he has conducted research in Nashville, USA. He chaired the Institute of Molecular Biology and Cell Biology at the Friedrich Leffler Institute. He was president of, during uh, 27 years of the Federal Research Institute of Animal Health <coughs> in Germany. His main field of research is animal virus infection. He is a member of several scientific academies, and na uh, national as well as international. And last but not least, he is a foreign member of our company. Our colleague will discuss, as Vanessa just uh, uh, told it before, the concept and the importance of one else with us. Without wait waiting, I now hand over the floor to our speaker. Oh, bonjour et bienvenue. Um, unfortunately, I can't be on site, so apologies for that. Um, and uh, unfortunately, my French is also not good enough to give a presentation in the French language, so I have to stick to English, which I hope is okay. I start with sharing my screen. Which I hope will, will work now. So, uh, welcome to this inter-pandemic session of the Academy. And in fact, uh, I will talk about pandemics a little later during my presentation. Um, and as has already been said, um, I have been president of the Friedrich Leffler Institute, the Federal Research Institute for Animal Health for 27 years. I retired in June 30 last year. And for those of you who are not familiar with Friedrich Leffler, actually he was one of the first co-workers of the famous bacteriologist Robert Koch. And in this context today, he is most important for us as the discoverer of the foot and mouth disease agent as the first filterable virus. So when we consider Robert Koch, the co-founder of bacteriology, Friedrich Leffler is actually also considered as the co-founder of virology. For bio-risk management reasons, as we would call it today, he established his research institute on an island in the Baltic Sea. And this is now this Friedrich Leffler Institute named after him. Um, he founded it on October 10th, 1910. Uh, so it is the world's oldest virus research facility, sometimes also called the Alcatraz for viruses. And I'm a virologist by training and, and by heart and soul. So viruses will play a role during my presentation. The Institute has two central missions. One is health and welfare of food producing animals which means for us from honeybee to cattle, and protection of humans from zoonotic infections. Now, this picture is very frequently being taken as a synonym for One Health. Um, however, it actually covers only one of the different interfaces that One Health is dealing with. It's a particularly important one. It's the interface animal-human, but as I said, it's just one. Um, basically, there are the three pillars of One Health, which are human health, animal health, and environmental health. And uh, the previous definition says that One Health concept recognizes that human health is connected with the health of animals and the environment. And this basically then says that One Health is just a center where these three circles actually overlap. So there are the different interfaces between human and animal health, which is generally called one medicine. This is not actually one health, it's just one, uh, one facet. Then we have the intersection environment, animal health, human health and environment, 
And in the intersection of all three sectors, just a, a couple of examples, for example, zoonosis with pandemic potential, or I could also use as an example, antimicrobial resistance, but I would focus on the zoonotic aspects. And this basically says that um, about 60% estimated of human infectious diseases are indeed of animal origin. Um, and also um, it's estimated that at least 75% of emerging infectious diseases of humans are actually zoonosis, that is they originate from animals. Which is not surprising in fact, since humans are part of the animal kingdom in a shared environment. And this is actually what one health means. Now the interface animal human does not always have to be so direct um, as you've seen here, but I always say, I mean, if you substitute the pig um, um, against, for example, dogs or cat um, or whatever pet you are having, um, I think it comes closer to a, at least a real situation in, in our areas. So there is the direct contact, but there is also a lot of inter indirect contacts in that interface. Animal food and products, contact with animal secretions, indirect contact um, with dust and droplets. Of course, then environmental contact, water, plants, surfaces. This is the environmental component of One Health. And for some of them also contact with vectors, that is, for example, insects or rodents that transmit infections. I'll just briefly give two examples. One is SARS-CoV-2, or SARS-CoV-2 COVID-19 is indeed a zoonosis. It originated from, uh, from bats, from these horseshoe bats in southern China, uh, spilled to humans. It's unclear when exactly and where and how and what role, for example, the live animal market in Wuhan really played. But I mean, the closest genetic relatives of SARS-CoV-2 are found in these uh, horseshoe bats. And then we have a purely human component. This is the pandemic that we experienced. But again, um, humans can transmit zoonotic agents back to animals, uh, in this case, to kept and wild animals. And from them, it could, uh, can uh, again uh, be transferred back to the human population. And this is exactly what we've seen in COVID-19. So for example, we have seen infected companion animals, fortunately not many, and they didn't play an epidemiological role in the pandemic. Um, uh, to this, um, uh, we saw infections in uh, kept wildlife, for example, in this uh, uh, minks in, uh, in Denmark, uh, where they got infected by a human virus and then uh, spilled the virus back to the human population. And what is currently going on in Northern America is that SARS-CoV-2 is actually spreading like wildfire in wildlife, in particular in this uh, uh, white-tailed deer population, establishing a separate epidemiology or episodiology from the human situation. And this is the general feature that we observe in these, uh, in these zoonotic infections. So there is a natural reservoir in animals. We have spillover into the human population, either directly or via so-called bridging species that could be livestock or kept uh, wildlife. And then, I mean, these are very frequent events, as we now know. Fortunately, only very rarely there is adaptation to a level that these agents then can spread efficiently between humans leading to local epidemics or even then global pandemics. And then human, infected humans can spill back to animals. And this happened in the, in the past very quite frequently. For example, the major pandemics, uh, be that Sw a Spanish flu in 1918-19 or swine flu in 2009, they originate from animals. We have the Avia Asian flu and Hong Kong flu that also have their origin in elements and, and several others. In particular, when we look at influenza A, for example, the flu, we very frequently, uh, very frequently have an anthropocentric point of view. We see the human population in the center. But if you look at the real epidemiology of influenza A, in the center are actually is the natural reservoir of wild aquatic birds. And there we have a plethora of different variants that are part of the ecology of this natural reservoir. And what we observe in humans, in, in pigs, and sometimes also then in, in poultry uh, are these spillover events that then can lead to catastrophic consequences. 
And what we actually observe at the moment, um, although it's not that widely known, uh, we have an unprecedented panzootic um, of an avian flu virus, a highly pathogenic avian influenza virus of the subtype, uh, subtype H5N1, which actually is now spreading all over the place. Um, it reached uh, uh, six of the seven continents. Um, it is also at the doorstep of Antarctica and, for example, in Southern America that has never experienced this particular infection. Um, there are tens of millions of victims of this panzootic, but the victims are birds, primarily at least. So this is something that demonstrates the capacity of spread of these infectious agents. But influenza virus also have an inherent zoonotic potential. And this is just a brief overview on spillover events that have been observed into mammals. Um, these are aquatic mammals, these are terrestrial mammals, these are carnivores that probably infect themselves by feeding on infected birds. Fortunately, the potential of this particular variant of influenza A to infect humans is still very low, but we have to keep an eye on that. Uh, we know that spillover occurs only at very, uh, uh, um, fortunately at only uh, rare occasions, but it's something uh, actually we have to uh, monitor. But when we focus on infectious diseases and look at the different influences that, for example, climate change or habitats, the globalization in trade, travel, and economy, and the population of animals, vectors, and humans have. Um, this is just one aspect of One Health. Uh, when we look at the sustainable development goals, and in particular, number three, um, good health is actually connected with good well being. And this dates back to an old WHO um, definition on health that says health is not simply absence of disease but health is an overall feeling of well-being in animals, one would say, animal welfare. So in the center of one health is actually health in, in including the uh, concept of well-being. Now, this sounds very logical, hopefully, but I mean, what does it really mean in terms of implementation? Uh, and it is important that the so-called science policy interface. And there has been quite some dynamics in the last couple of years uh, also at the political level. The four global organizations that deal with health in the human sector, in the animal sector, and in the environmental sector have actually joined um, um, two years ago in March uh, 2022 to form the Quadripartite for One Health. So this is the Food and Agriculture Organization, this is the World Health Organization, this is the World Organization for Animal Health, previously OIE, and the United Nations Environmental Programme. And I think this is a major step forward in really putting, uh, implementing One Health. And these four have, have established an advisory panel, the so-called One Health High-Level Expert Panel that met for the first time in May 2021. Um, and I have the pleasure to co-chair um, this first term of the panel that actually ended uh, by the end of last year together with my colleague, um, Wanda Marquata from South Africa. Now, these are 26 experts in um, the different areas that deal with One Health. And uh, we have an advisory role to the partners. Uh, we have to provide relevant scientific assessment and give advice on a long-term strategic approach. So this is an, a natural task of the science policy interface. Now, in the first term uh, that lasted for two and a half years, um, there were a number of outputs that you can actually read on the homepage uh, with uh, definition uh, theory of change. We have a white paper on prevention of zoonotic spillover um, and some, some other outputs. Um, so we were quite busy in this first term to set the stage for uh, implementation of One Health. And what's most important, and that's why I really focus on that a little longer, is that we established a new One Health definition. Um, I think it was important because there were so many different definitions of One Health around that it was really, really difficult uh, to talk at the same level and, uh, and at the same basis. And we came up with this definition, One Health is an integrated unifying approach that aims to sustainably balance and optimize the health of people, animals, and ecosystems. It recognizes the health of humans, domestic and wild animals, plants, and the wider environment including ecosystems are closely linked and interdependent. 
The approach mobilizes multiple sectors, disciplines, and communities at varying levels of society to work together to foster well being and tackle threats to health and ecosystems by addressing the collective need for healthy food, water, energy, and air, taking action on climate change, and contributing to sustainable development. And this is accompanied by this uh, visual diagram. This is founded on five foundational principles. And these are equity between sectors and disciplines, a socio-political parity, socio-ecological equilibrium, stewardship and the responsibility of humans, and the transdisciplinarity and multi-sectoral collaboration. So when we just, uh, uh, compare this new definition with the old one that I mentioned at the very beginning, um, the old one was centered on this overlap of the three circles. So it was a very focused uh, and a very exclusive uh, definition. Now we have actually a very inclusive, multi-sectoral, systemic, transdisciplinary or inter transsectoral interdisciplinary definition. And this then also means that one health by the new definition is overarching the other uh, integrated health approaches like global health, which focuses on humans, the old one health that focuses just on the center, eco health that takes uh, uh, ecology or ecosystems into center, and planetary health, which also focuses primarily on the human civilization. Now, to bring this interaction, um, the quadripartite together with the One Health High Level Expert Panel have devised an, a, a One Health Joint Plan of Action with six action tracks. Action track one is enhan enhancing One Health's capacities to strengthen the health systems. Action track two is reducing the risks from emerging and re-emerging zoonotic epidemics and pandemics. Action track three, controlling and eliminating endemic zoonotic neglected tropical and vector-borne diseases. Action track four, strengthening the assessment, management, and communication of food safety risks. Action track five, curbing the silent pandemic of antimicrobial resistance. And action track six, integrating the environment into one. Now, this has been taken up at a political level, actually quite aptly in the last couple of years, not the least assisted by the uh, uh, COVID-19 pandemic. But most importantly at the moment is that this approach, this One Health approach, finds its way into the WHO uh, uh, pandemic agreement that is currently under negotiation, under final negotiation, under leadership of the WHO. So this is a convention agreement or other international instrument on pandemic prevention, preparedness, and response. So it is this triad, prevention, preparedness, and response that is important. And when we look again um, at this uh, um, sequence of events that I showed before, then preparedness and response is actually something that comes into place when the spillover into the human population has already happened, when adaptation to the human population is ongoing and it's threatened to become an epidemic or pandemic. Um, this is, of course, very valid. But if we really talk about prevention, actually we need to focus on this particular interface. So if we really want to prevent um, future pandemics or epidemics, or at least reduce the frequency, I, wouldn't, uh, I would be a little cautious in talking about complete prevention, but reducing the frequency, I mean, this is actually the interface that we have to target. And this is the spillover. And so uh, in last year, um, OLEP, uh, put out a definition and, uh, um, of, of prevention of spillover to also make it clear what it's meant by prevention and preparedness and response. And this reflects what I just said. Preparedness and response is something that focuses then on the human population after the spillover. But prevention focuses on, for example, animal populations in the environment before spillover actually occurs. Um, and in, at the current, this is published at the current stage of the negotiations, um, and this is an older version because the newer one is still not publicly available. And in uh, newer versions of this uh, uh, pandemic agreement, um, there is first of all a stronger focus on prevention than before. 
And second, uh, One Health also plays a quite prominent role, including the full definition of OLAP. So to conclude uh, and the take home message for, from this very brief uh, overview on One Health is actually um, what I already showed. Humans are part of the animal kingdom in a shared environment. Sometimes it's phenotypically more easily to assess, sometimes less so, but genetically, biologically, it's very clear. And the last one, and this has already been mentioned in the introduction, uh, when we look at One Health in this new definition and what I try to explain, then One Health is actually really not a concept, but One Health is a way of living and we all can contribute to One Health. With this, I close. I thank you very much for your attention. And I always close my lectures with this, my favorite emoji. Um, and it is my favorite emoji because it looks like freaking <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, and I'm happy to, uh, The floor is open for questions. Yes. Thank you very much, Sean. This is very ambitious. Um, I was recently at the World Congress of Neurology where I was suggesting one brain as a concept. Um, and I had a hard time there. Now, one health, and you say that it resonates with the, the World Health uh, Organization, we still use very much the definition of health suggested by the World Health Organization, which is uh, very much anthropocentric. Uh, if we are to consider uh, other realms uh, with regard to health, we still do it from a human prison, but presumably the very concept, you say it's not a concept, the concept of health should perhaps be redefined for, for animals and plants, or shouldn't it? I mean, this is something that we try to do with our One Health definition. Um, this One Health definition of OLED is not anthropocentric. Um, it's basically planetary or cosmocentric, uh, whatever you would like to call it. Um, and it includes plants, for example. It includes the environment specifically. Um, so I think we are, at, 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 at a, or should I say, a major leap uh, closer towards understanding or, or defining one health in a more holistic way and not anthropocentric. But of course, I mean, the WHO um, is uh, an organization that deals primarily at least with human health. And that's why I think it's so important to have the quadripartite uh, where these organizations also represent animal health as well as environmental or ecosystem health. Other question? Thank you very much for your uh, wonderful talk. Uh, I have uh, one question. Does the role of the companion animals, as cats and other, uh, are as vector of disease than usually considered uh, by in your life? This was very difficult for me to understand. It's a, it's a, a, a very low voice. Could you please repeat? Uh, does the role of uh, companion animals, uh, pets, cats and other, higher as vector of disease than usually considered in uh, our life? I think that, that depends on, on the situation and, and, and on the regions. I mean, of course, we know that we have uh, I mean, for example, uh, uh, antimicrobial resistance bacteria, they transmit between companion animals and, and humans, and they also transmit their, their resistances. Um, we have others like, for example, toxoplasmosis, where we know um, that we have an animal reservoir. Um, I think uh, it's, I, I, would, I would refrain uh, from prioritizing, I mean, certain kinds of, of animals, whether it's uh, companion animals or, or livestock, it's very, pretty much dependent on the situation, but we have to keep in mind that this is an interface that just allows pathogens uh, to transfer uh, between animals and humans. And actually, uh, as I said before, it goes into both directions. Uh, I mean, swine flu, the uh, 2009 pandemic, 
uh, was primarily a human pandemic, but humans were very efficient um, in, for example, transmitting this swine flu virus to uh, uh, swine populations, where this virus is now recombining um, very happily with uh, uh, other viruses that are uh, other influenza viruses that are already there. Uh, but the, I mean, the United Nations has a re had a, a report out at the beginning of the pandemic um, that actually says, of course, um, the the likelihood um, of this intimate contact between humans and animals, intimate direct contact, um, is closer uh, or it's it's, it's uh, uh, great uh, bigger uh, in uh, when we have closer contact, and this is of course something that we have more towards companion animals or livestock than uh, to wildlife. But this only only applies to the direct contact. Thank you very much for your very interesting talk. So I have a question on the place of nutrition in this concept of One Health, animal and human nutrition. Is it important to take it into consideration? Yes, I think it is. I mean, nutrition is a major factor, of course, in, in health. Um, if we if we consider health not as absence of, of, of infectious disease. So I think this is something that needs to be taken into account. And that's why we also have it in uh, in our definition as well. Um, so um, there's, there's are all different facets of one health. I always kind of try to caution. Um, it's not the, de the definition does not say that that I mean, one sector or one discipline or even one person has to take care of everything that is in there. It's just a holistic approach that says, I mean, if we have a, a, a certain uh, um, issue to tackle, uh, just take into account that there are others um, that are also interested in the same issue um, that uh, we need to join forces with. Thank you for your beautiful lecture. I would like to know if you can a little bit more discuss about the effect of uh, climate warming on uh, one hands. Uh, what are the contributions of, of climate warming? I think we have, we have also different aspects here. I mean, the, the climate crisis is definitely developing also, of course, into a health crisis as well, or it is a health crisis as well for different aspects. Now, I come from the infectious diseases area. This is where I, I feel myself more most uh, familiar with. Um, and what we are actually seeing is, of course, that climate change has an impact, in particular on infections that have a climate component, uh, like, for example, uh, vector-borne infections. I mean, vectors, uh, be they arthropod vectors or rodent vectors, they are influenced by, by climate. And this is actually what we also see in different areas. Um, it's still a multifactorial situation that we see, um, and it's sometimes a little difficult uh, or a little more difficult to really establish uh, uh, which uh, specific factor that we observe is directly caused and not just correlated with climate change. But for example, we see change in, in, in populations, we see, we see a change in, in our, in our um, fauna uh, all around us, uh, just mentioning, for example, new vectors that had their, their habitat now in, in Central Europe, like the Asian tiger mosquito or the Japanese bush mosquito with different and, and additional vector competences that we didn't have uh, here in Central Europe so far. This is just an example that these things are already ongoing, of course. We have a question for from our virtual attendees. Yes. Uh, question for uh, from Professor Kurt Sagerman, uh, who is asking: Is there uh, are there any recommendations for OH education or under your panel also? Yeah, I mean we are advocating, of course, uh, um, for for one health education. Um, um, not only at the university and, and the, at the postgraduate level, but I mean, more at the general level. So our idea is actually to establish One Health educational um, aspects um, already rather early in school, because I think it's a mindset and, and uh, exercise that we need to do. People have to really realize that we have this intrinsic linkage between humans, animals, and, and the environment. Um, and uh, to my opinion, that, that can't be said early enough. Um, 
we do realize that this is um, a, um, a major effort. Um, there are some areas where it already works rather well, um, but there is a lot of room for improvement. Um, as, as for OLAP, uh, we are advocating for that. Um, but I also have to say that uh, in our first term, those are the first two and a half years, we as OLEP were, of course, then pretty much focused on, on um, the, the question of the, of, of the pandemic and prevention of pandemics. Uh, I think in the, in the term two, which will focus on the six action points, and the first action point is focusing on one health in a broader aspect, um, this, will be, uh, this will focus um, uh, uh, on that problem more prominently with more priority. There are two new questions in the room. Thank you very much for this very interesting lecture um, and for being a member of the One Health panel of the Federation of the European Academy of Medicine. So the team was asked to provide some advice to the Commission and one question is what are the research gaps that will be uh, important to cover before the new pandemics. And uh, I wanted to ask your opinion because obviously we could recommend more research in biology, which was a little bit neglected because biology was used as vector for all the cell and molecular biology. But if you have also other ideas, I'll be very happy to hear them. Um. I think there there are there are several gaps. I mean, some of them have been now realized and and tried to be uh, to be filled um, during the pandemic. Um, I think we still uh, need to enhance our research work on on wildlife populations. Uh, we still have I think too little information um, on, uh, for example, what's what's out there. Quite simply, and this is of course not just viruses. I took viruses as an example. Um, and uh, because the last pandemics were actually caused by viruses, but of course there are others. So I think this is a component that we need to take into account. Um, and then there is, um, uh, as far as I see, there is a need to do more research on the influence, on the impact of these different factors on the One Health, for example. Um, so, I mean, climate change, for example, is, is, an, uh, is a, a, um, a situation that we know it's going on, but it is, uh, at least in the last couple of years, very um, rarely been connected to, I mean, distinct health um, um, concepts. Um, so this would be one. Um, the importance of, uh, of biodiversity, for example, on, on health in general, um, human health, animal health, environmental health, and its impact um, on these spillovers. Um, and in fact, there is an, an, an opinion uh, that has been published by the um, Eclipse Project funded by the European Union that deals with some of these, these areas. And actually, uh, I mean, this was also um, recommended uh, by, um, for example, myself as well. Last question, Cedric. Thank you. Uh, this is a fascinating lecture, uh, but this is also a very ambitious uh, concept. So don't you think that to make this a reality in the future, shouldn't the ability of, you know, the countries, regional governments to be able to provide one health uh, be used as some sort of ranking parameter in the future? Because, you know, countries, you know, are ranked according to their growth or, you know, but I think that could be a very good indicator uh, to classify countries and stimulate them uh, to achieve this in the future. I mean, I, I agree. Uh, there's definitely something that, that needs to be done. Um, I mean, we are also advocating, for example, for, for uh, national and regional one health plans. Um, I know that the paper is patient, but on the other hand, I mean, if I have something on, uh, to put something on paper, we have to think about it first. Um, and this is something that, that I think is an, it is an important step. Um, it's always difficult in, in prioritization uh, towards others, because then um, there are completely different scenarios. Um, but um, I would still advocate for one that says um, uh, that, uh, I mean, either countrywide or regionwide, um, um, uh, one health, um, national one health plans or one health action plans would, would, would be uh, a major step forward. And then I think it's, it becomes quite obvious where, where the gaps in a particular country or in a particular regions actually are. Uh, but first of all, you have to think about it uh, in detail. Uh, to be aware of what's there and what needs to be done. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much.